Okay, it's, it's nine o'clock. Um, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, many thanks for uh, bracing uh, the morning snow to come to this session uh, about the China outlook. I'm very sorry for my uh, Beijing cough, and uh, certainly this is one of the issues that will be touched upon and in the next uh, 60 minutes. And uh, Davos is very much about traditionally to do with outlooks. And uh, China has been um, the star of Davos in the past decade, especially in the past five years. And, but this year, I think the way by which we're discussing China and the future direction of China will be slightly different. First, I think China is slowing down uh, following three and a uh, half decades of a phenomenal economic growth, double digits growth. And uh, China is slowing down, and China and its people and the government wanted it to slow down because it's realized that uh, a such model of development and economic growth is unsustainable. So we're expecting in 2014, probably I think between 7.5 GDP growth, compared with a couple of years ago, double digits. And um, I forgot to you know, say a few words about myself, sorry, I think, you know, and uh, I'm Li Fen uh, Zhang, I'm a journalist from the Financial Times, and for the past 10 years, and I was given the responsibility of uh, taking care of uh, ftchinese.com, which is uh, the Financial Times only foreign language publication. And so we have been and on, the, on, the, on the front line of reporting on what's go going on in China. So uh, today I think we have a, a very, very distinguished and the panelists, and uh, the reason I say distinguished, I, I really mean it. And uh, so I will just give, uh, I think most of them, they are Davos regulars, and uh, I think the gentleman, I think on my uh, left, uh, the Victor Chu, and Victor has been around at Davos for many, many years, I think probably 30 years? 19. 19 years, <laughs> yes. And um, Victor um, is, um, a um, leading uh, investment banker who actually has the chairman and also the CEO uh, of uh, First Eastern Investment Group based in Hong Kong, uh, who is also a avid observer of the financial mar Chinese financial markets. And uh, I think the next one is Neil, Neil Shen Nanpeng. And Neil is, uh, has been uh, uh, and regarded as one of the um, most well-known and venture capitalist in China, and uh, he has been often voted among the most influential business leaders in China. And um, I was told by a friend that uh, Neil is, uh, has a reputation of turning stone into gold. <laughs> so I hope I think he will be able to share some tips with us. You know, so we all want to be rich and rich quickly. <laughs> we'll leave that to the government to send hand. <laughs> And, um, and I think next speaker, and also a very familiar face um, in Davos, and, um, and the Minister Zhang Xiaoqiang, and who is the Vice Chairman and NDCR, and which is the super ministry uh, and from the Chinese central government. And especially and given the impetus that uh, uh, Mr. Xi Jinping's uh, new leadership, and obviously I think uh, he will be sharing with us some of the inside um, stories about the new thinking of the leadership. And uh, so we're really uh, looking forward to that. And uh, next one is actually the only non-Chinese speaker on a panel, and, uh, and also someone who needs no introduction at all, and the Professor Rory Grubini, a professor of economics from, and, um, from New York <laughs> University, and um, who is a f familiar face all over the world for accurately predicting the last global financial crisis. And, uh, but my only hope is that he's not going to break in any bad news uh, today. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the other thing that which we just jokingly say is uh, the reason why Professor was chosen and, uh, and invited, he said he want to learn Chinese. So next time, I think, from next year, I think he will be able to actually join the session and speak in Chinese. And, uh, and finally is um, Professor Li Daokui, and a leading Chinese uh, journalist, uh, leading Chinese uh, economist, and who is now teaching and doing research at Tsinghua University, one of the best universities in China, uh, who was also um, a former member 
of the Chinese Central Bank's Monetary Committee. So uh, now he's a former member, so he got to be much freer in expressing um, and his views. And uh, so before I move on to give each of the panelists um, um, the chance to uh, open in their remarks, and just a few points that I would like to highlight. And one thing is that I think there's some good news, which is, uh, you know, one year into the new leadership, and especially and after uh, the party's third plenary session, mapping out um, what is China going to do. So this time, I think the reform scheme uh, has been, um, many of the Western commentators has regarded this as probably one of the most comprehensive <coughs> reforming and the blueprint that China is going to uh, implement and in the next 10 years. But we all know that um, from words to deeds can be a challenging process. And there's no doubt, uh, I think, uh, next five years is going to be difficult and because uh, uh, the new leadership led by President Xi Jinping and the Premier Li Keqiang and has not only inherited the second largest economy in the world, and the largest trading power in the world, you know, the three trillion US dollar foreign currency reserve, but also I think inherited a long list of legacy issues. A economy which is a favor of GDP growth, or even some women may call it addiction to GDP, and um, not the quality of growth an environment which is, is already an ecosystem which is already further serious damage to both in the urban and in rural. And a financial system is yet to be liberalized. A currency is yet to be liberalized. And a gigantic urbanization and um, scheme and or, 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 or plan which is going to throw out a lot, lot of uh, social and economic and problem. And also a system which is still ridden uh, with corruption, and both in politics as well as in business. And also, the poor and the rich divide is not only decreasing, but actually increasing. So I think China now is really facing a series of a problem which can only be overcome by the political willpower that is, first of all, address the issue and taking this issue heads on. So I think, you know, so today I think, uh, and uh, I think uh, um, all our five, our five panelists is going to do just that. I know that uh, analyzing China is a risky business and uh, there's no crystal balls, and, but we all want to have one. So I think I can, I can promise you that each and every of us will try to do the very best. So I will first, I think I would actually let um, Professor Robini to speak first as a courtesy because the rest of them are all Chinese. And uh, Professor first. Uh, thanks very much. It's a great honor being on this panel, being the only non-Chinese speakers. I live in New York City where most people in Manhattan, when they have a child today, they have a Chinese nanny because they want their children to learn Mandarin from very early on. So I think that's going to be the trend in the future. You have to learn Mandarin. I'll make sure I'll do it myself. Um, as you pointed out, uh, and the Chinese leadership has recognized, the model of growth of China is uncoordinated, is unsustainable, is uh, un uh, un uh, unstable. And there are a number of imbalances. Uh, the key one, in my view, of course, is the one that there is too much uh, savings, too much fixed investment, 50% uh, of GDP, and too little private consumption, at least the official numbers suggest, 36% uh, of GDP. Uh, there is also an imbalance uh, between the quantity and the quality of growth that has led to vast amount of environmental damage. Uh, the quality of air, of water, of land, uh, issue of food safety. Uh, there are regional imbalances between the coastal regions that have been growing faster and are richer and the interland of the country that has been poorer. Uh, there are imbalances between rich and poor, as you pointed out, that are issues of uh, income inequality are becoming uh, serious as well. I would say, however, among these imbalances, the key one is exactly the need to rebalance the economy from too much 
uh, savings and fixed investment towards private consumption. And certainly the reforms that have been announced in the term plenum of the party would go in the direction of doing that rebalancing. Um, you can never discount the ability of Chinese policymakers to do the right thing. After all, for the last 30 years, the country has been growing 10% per year, and therefore something good has been done, and they could be successful in this rebalancing. But I would like to point out some elements, or at least skepticism, of why things might not turn out. And if you don't rebalance, instead of a soft landing, you might have a hard landing. First of all, even at the third plan of 10 years ago, uh, there were similar kind of things. We have to rebalance towards consumption from fixed investment, so that share of consumption fell, and the one of fixed investment went from 40 to 50% of GDP. There was a lost decade of reforms. So why this time around is going to be different? I know it's going to be different, but the question is, will reforms be implemented as fast as is optimal and desirable? Uh, secondly, for the last four years, every time there's been a slowdown of China, uh, as it happened after the global financial crisis, the country has doubled down on the same model of credit-fueled fixed investment that is going to real estate, to infrastructure, to access capacity by the state-owned enterprises in 2009, 2010, 11, and this year as well. And every time an extra dollar or yuan of credit is having less effect on GDP in terms of amount of it and how much the economy recovers. So the rebalancing has not occurred. As the Chinese leadership says, we need to grow at least 7%, then you can be skeptical on this rebalancing because rebalancing is going to imply growing maybe 6% or less for a while if you're really serious about rebalancing. A third point, as you pointed out, there are issues of implementation. Are these going to be implemented or not? Uh, talk is cheap, if so sweet. So we'll have to see action. And so far, we have not seen, in my view, as much action. And finally, I make also the observation that in China, there are some interest groups that are, are against this rebalancing because they've been benefiting of the old model of growth base on fixed investment. I would say state-owned enterprises, and there is not a real serious reform of SOEs uh, in the making. Provincial governments, where you get promoted uh, based on the quantity of growth, not the quality of growth. If you are a provincial uh, leader and you want to succeed to become a member of the Politburo or Standing Committee, uh, the state sector, the PLA, these are groups that are internally influential, they're powerful, they're organized, while those who will be benefiting mostly from the rebalancing are consumer, households, wage earners that are not as politically organized. So the question is, will these things be implemented when you have lots of interest groups that are against it? Now, the Chinese leadership includes, starting with the president and premier, people who want reform, but there's a collegial leadership that has a group of people, some of them more conservative, some of them more reform-oriented. I worry that this is going to be a gradual process and China's not going to rebalance fast enough compared to what's desirable and optimal, and therefore the risk of a potential hard landing have not been totally actually cleared yet. Okay, there's a lot of, uh, um, lot of issues which uh, Professor Rubini mentioned. I just want to turn to uh, Minister Zhang. And, uh, um, but I think the professor highlighted a lot of uh, the difficulties, um, especially about the implementations. And uh, you have been working in um, one of the most important and the government department uh, actually tasked with uh, reforming. And do you think uh, can this uh, new leadership actually deliver uh, what it, it actually promised? I think that after third plenary of the party central committee, they have a very strong signal for the Chinese government to push ahead the all round and deepening the reform and opening. And I think even though someone mentioned that in the country, not every people to support this kind of the reform and opening, but if we look back to the history of the last more than three decades, we can see most of the people, including some many of the government officials, we realize only the reform and the opening is the strategic choice for China to implement a strategic target to modernize the country. And the practice already show the reform and opening is the strongest input for the sustainable development. But of course, after three decades reform, the balance of the 
reform will still remain a very hard one. But I think that both the senior leader of the country, the government official, and entrepreneurs and the citizens have a very strong support for this reform. But of course, how to implement this reform in an efficient way is a challenge. Yeah, I, I just want to have a follow-up question, I think, uh, from Professor Rabini. Uh, actually, I think, you know, obviously the, uh, the, the third preliminary uh, session, that report, uh, obviously were very well received, both in China as well in the West. But there's a particular couple of uh, uh, issues which are absent. For example, the deepening reform of uh, the state-owned enterprises, which is one of the most thorny issues facing China in the past decades. And is that, what's the reason why um, the state of enterprise reform was particularly, was, was missed uh, there? Is that because of the interest group they were opposing to such reform because it will harm their interest? Uh, frankly speaking, I think that even though someone thinks that in the last five years or last decade, the state on reform has been thrown down. But personally, I think there still has some progress in the state on prices. And uh, for example, for many of the state on prices have improved or reformed it to formally, you know, 100% state on prices to change to, a, you know, mixed shareholder modern company, and some of the state-owned enterprises now have been put into a very strong market competition, and through this competition, they increase their competitiveness and the efficiencies in a rapid way. But of course, for certain sectors, the reform is still not enough. It's in some extent, for my personal experience, related to the central government of the China's characteristic because I'm very no know the China's basic system is we call the socialist market economy. That means we need both the public sector and the private sector. And according to a constitution, the public sector should control the major sector of the national economy. But the problem the country we are facing is that which kind of the sector should be treated as a national strategic sector? For example, I don't think the iron and steel industry in the future should be treated as a strategic sector for the country. I don't think that the automobile sector should be treated as a national strategic sector. So that's the job, particularly for DRC in the future. We need to have a clear picture how to concentrate the state asset in the real you know, strategic sector and put other sector open more to the private sectors, to the mixed economy. Yeah, so the hybrid mixed economy. And uh, I think um, um, Professor Li Daoke is very itching uh, to say something. And your yeah, I just want to clarify, if you read the decision of the third premium, actually the uh, reform of state and enterprises is one of the highlights. There are two simple points. The first point of the reform is to in improve the corporate governance of SOEs, including increasing the number of professionally hired CEOs rather than appointed by the government. Second point is also, also very important. That is to turn the SOEs into financial holding companies like CIC, China Investment Corporation. So down the road, maybe five or 10 years, no longer there will be first auto works, right? or, or Dongfeng Auto Works. There will be a financial holding company whose, whose <coughs> shares are are shares of multiple enterprises in the country, including private enterprises, maybe even including Volkswagen. I know Professor Heisman is here. But uh, one thing which I think many of the people thinking, one of the key criteria uh, for reforming China's state or enterprise is abolishing the political appointment system. I think this is one of the th things. Uh, otherwise, I think the modern, I think boardroom structure will never be properly implemented. 
You know, if a, a governor of a bank can be rotational among all major a banks, I think this is not something which China want to manifest about itself as an open and a liberal economy. So I just don't know. Do you think that? A well, look at, the, look at the Singaporean model. They have the Tamasic. They have the government investment corporation. The CEOs, or chairmen of these companies, are appointed by the government of Singapore. Well, these companies are holding shares of multiple enterprises, and in the end, they are very efficient. I think competition is very important. There should be a, a system of evaluating the performance of the managers of these financial holding companies. Thank you, and uh, Victor, from where you sit in Hong Kong. Thank, thank you so much, Ali Fong. Uh, first of all, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I take great comfort in uh, hearing what Professor Robinho said. I think this is the most bullish assessment. I've ever heard from uh, the distinguished <laughs> professor. Um, I, I think that's a very, very good uh, start uh, to begin with. I think uh, short-term outlook of China uh, is mainly uh, politics. I think we, we all understand that the challenges facing China is massive, but I think we all understand that the Chinese leadership really understand uh, what needs to be done, what has to be done, and they've laid out a very rational blueprint uh, in the last third plenum to execute the plan. Now, obviously, the third plenum is an event in itself. Um, the, the test of the success of that blueprint will come in the next three, five, seven years. But as uh, uh, Minister Jiang said, China is looking forward to have, with the benefit of the experience of the last 30 years of reform, is undergoing another major period of transition to achieve strategic sustainable development. And what that means in business terms is to increase the competitiveness of the Chinese economy and the Chinese enterprises. Now, some of them are low hanging fruits, like simplifying the bureaucracy within the Chinese system. And as, as you say, Chairman, some of the legacy problems are now being dealt with uh, very quickly. But what I, I, I've seen is that the speed in which the, leadership, the president has consolidated his, uh, his uh, power base is, uh, is surprising to begin with, but is uh, understood and, um, and uh, encouraging. Because he needs to really get the architecture of power right in order to execute that program. And, and, and we hope that you know, with a rational, determined, and courageous leadership at the top, that some of these challenging programs can be, can be done. It's not easy. Uh, it's a long and winding road. But uh, if you look at the track record of China in the last 30 years, I think uh, the medium to long-term outlook has to be positive. So uh, I think that's my, my starting point. Thank you, Victor. And then Neil. Yeah, I think, you know, obviously there's a lot of issues, but in general, if you look at the last three, four, five years, the quality of the growth has really been improved. Um, obviously, the growth rate has been coming down, you know, 7 to 8 percent. A lot of people complain that was a lot lower compared to what it used to be. But if you look into the very uh, details, for example, there are many sectors which um, should be the pillar of the country 10 years, 20 years down the road. They are enjoying some very quality growth. Information technology is one of them. Healthcare are, you know, are the other. And obviously, consumer industry in general are picking up very quickly as urbanization accelerating. So I think you know, um, this is exactly what we, uh, as an investor, like to see. You see a bigger divergent of growth among different sectors. And in a way, that's actually is gradually solving the problem of this economic um, um, structural issues because uh, very traditional manufacturing sectors like glass, cement, or steel, whatever, their growth rate has been coming down. And the new economy, or those more prominent sectors, are taking more weight. And, and I think this happened in the backdrop of um, market forces is uh, play a very important role here. Uh, I think the third plan has put this as the most critical message, that you will let the market forces to be the determining factor in resource allocation. I think it has happened before, actually already in the last several years, and I believe that probably going to be accelerated in the future. 
And if that does happen, I see there's a lot of you know sector will continue this kind of quality growth. Very good example here is uh, the information technology sectors. We are talking about companies big, gigantic, uh, Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba. The top, uh, you know, uh, they are in the top uh, ten in the global, you know, information technology uh, you know, arena, and they, and they are not just big; they're very competitive. If you put them against the folks like Facebook and Google or Amazon, you know, and Apple, they are very very competitive. Look at their, you know, uh, you know, growth rate. They look at the margins. They look at their, you know, competitive positions. And you will imagine probably sometime down the road, these will become global companies, not just you know uh, companies addressing the China market. So I think you know, uh, you know, back to uh, you know the issue of sort of how we we can solve those you know uh, legacy issues. Um, if we continue to see this kind of mic you know market force be the driving forces uh, in you know resource allocation, and we continue to some quality growth, growth ultimately will take out the problems. This is the thesis uh, back 10 years ago, 20 years ago. A lot of people do not believe in that. Uh, back in you know 1997, you know when when the Asian crisis, people think that the Chinese financial system is in big big jeopardy. Uh, but growth solve a big part of the problem, or probably you know most of the problem. Today, I think we are in a, back in the same position. I think you know if we continue to see quality growth, they will take out those legacy issues. Personally, I don't think you know we should expecting some magic like you know. Sort of sudden, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, a change to the optimal uh, economic structure. No one can that you know, have done that historically. In fact, I think if you change things dramatically, you know, with kind of sudden death kind of plan, you actually going to create a lot of issues. Uh, a gradually uh, transition to a more optimal economic structure is, I believe, in the works. And obviously, there are a lot of challenges, but definitely, I'm on the more optimistic camp. So I think in a world where I think you know negative growth and also I think no growth at all are were actually commonplace in some parts of the world, and I think New said basically let the growth take care of itself. If there's a growth, there will be, and this is a problem solving. I know that uh, Professor uh, Dokwe Li Dokwe has actually actually coined a new kind of theory. It's about a sandwich theory. And probably this is the right platform to, for you to share it. Well, China outlook is such a uh, big topic and uh, an old topic. It's very hard to um, tell people what's new. So let me try my hard to tell three things you may not know, okay, about this uh, China outlook. First word is about the sandwich, okay? What is sandwich? Sandwich is something cut, you know, two layers in the middle in between. Now, I think today's reform dynamism is a sandwich structure with the Xi Jinping on the top being very determined to push reform. I oftentimes describe him as a mini Deng Xiaoping, right? So trying, working, you know, all the, uh, very hard pushing reforms. By the way, two days ago when Prime Minister An Bei was giving his talk, I was there, many of you were there, right? Very impressive talk. He's a wonderful, wonderful politician. Meanwhile, at the same time, Xi Jinping held his very first meeting of the central government uh, work group uh, leading towards comprehensive reform. And he said in that first meeting, while well, Anbei was making a speech here, that timetable should be made for every item of reform. So that's the first layer, the top leadership. The, mid, the lower layer are the grassroots people, including readers of Financial Times, not China, right? Very, very popular, very powerful. So don't underestimate your power as journalist. So the readers of Financial Times, the users of internet are also pushing for reforms. They are complaining about many, many things, ranging from corruption to pollution. In the middle are some of the colleagues of Mr. Zhang, not himself, okay, who are so comfortable with the current system, they don't want to reform. So today's dynamism is two layers squeezing the middle part. So the top leadership has picked up the most popular agenda of reform that is anti-corruption. So anti-corruption was chosen as the first item. Very popular, very, very popular. I think that's the first step to get to galvanize political support for further economic reforms. That's the first thing I want to mention, sandwich. Second thing I want to mention is slowing down. I think this round of reform, unlike the previous rounds of reform, actually is contractionary. Contractionary, I mean, for, is, is against growth. For example, 
For example, the anti-corruption campaign, frankly speaking, is not pro-growth. Why? Because Chinese officials are used to having fancy banquets with entrepreneurs during which they sign deals. But now, fancy banquets are, are illegal in the anti-campaign movement, right? So suddenly, many officials and entrepreneurs don't know how to talk about business deals, right? There's no, they have to t take time to, for them to discover new ways to do deals. So in the short run, this year and next year, I predict there will be struggle, a struggle to maintain 7.5% growth, which is the, the medium target of the reform in order to create 7 million new jobs for the college graduates. So these two years will be difficult. If the reforms can be implemented properly this year and next year, then I, for my forecast would be that the, the growth rate will go back to something of high seventh, close to 8%. Now, the third point I want to mention is risk. Risk, I do share with uh, Nereo on the risks. There are risks about the Chinese economy. I don't think the local debt is a major risk. That can be dealt relatively easily. Overall, the Chinese economy still has room to issue debt as a whole the economy. I don't think the shadow banking is a major, major risk because much of the shadow banking in China is actually very much needed in order for the banking sector to serve small and medium enterprises. The major risk is whether China will be able to do a soft landing of its property price. The property price has been running very fast, ending with the result of the ratio of housing price to income would be 20 or even 25 years. So I hope, I definitely hope, there will be a situation in which housing price continuously growing, land price growing, local governments can still get revenue from selling land. However, the growth rate is lower than the nominal GDP. So after three, four, five years, the, effort, the affordability ratio of housing comes down. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think you mentioned that. You, you, you're basically thinking that uh, one of the issues that we're going to talk about, which is the I think the uh, the uh, the serious I think local government debt is not a serious problem, and you don't think. But I just wonder whether Victor and uh, did you share share um, uh, share Dalkey's view that um, local um, government debt, because the uh, central government has just for the first time did a very comprehensive auditing about local government debt. Actually, uh, the figure now is amount to be three trillion U.S. dollars. It's slightly more than three trillion U.S. dollars, and uh, and also the pace of increasing is actually gigantic. Yep. Some of the commentators are kind of thinking this is actually a kind of a time bomb in the system. And yep. uh, did you share with that? I'd like to make three points. Uh, first of all, the the growth of uh, credit from the shadow banking sector is is uh, is very fast. On the other hand, we should not um, classify the shadow banking's credit as necessary. Oh, they're all bad. You know, some of the I mean, shadow banking sector, what we call in the West, secondary banking sector, uh, is, 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 is very useful because some sectors in China do not have access to, 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 to the capital market. So I think um, uh, the government understands the issue and as a whole is still a relatively manageable part uh, of, the, of the system. So I, I agree with David that uh, I think it's, it's totally manageable. I think where... Uh, I also agree with David that we are looking forward to a period of a lot more sensible, lower uh, headline growth. We're going for more quality, sustainable, recurrent growth rather than uh, growth in headline. And, but that also has a good um, uh, spin-off. And that is where, where growth is low. It put pressure on, on furthering reform. We will have bolder uh, reform coming through. For example, we all uh, are very excited about the Shanghai, the new Shanghai trade, trade zone, um, which um, will give a lot more freedom in the professional services uh, to flourish uh, in, in China, a benchmark to, to global market uh, conditions. But Shanghai is not alone. There will be other special trade zones coming through, um, uh, a la um, Tianjin, uh, Guangdong. So you'll see that that is really at the beginning of another set of economic revolution, you know, freeing up uh, the market 
um, to, to both international and domestic uh, uh, competition. Uh, thirdly, in terms of risk, I think in the short term, the, the most serious risk is, uh, is, is uh, politics, whether the consolidation of power could have any backlash. You know, we are, at the moment, we are going after the big elephant in the anti-corruption campaign. Um, I, 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 I personally, I think the, the transition will be, will be smooth and consolidation power will be very complete and very effective. But if there were to be backlash, that's the risk in the domestic uh, side. Also on the external side, if there were accident in the territorial uh, uh, challenges with, with Japan and other countries, if there were accident before politics and diplomacy can get the parties back to the uh, a new status quo, that could be serious. So I think the risk is politics, external, Yep. And, and internal, yeah, rather than economic. Yeah, obviously, I think I will, I will not ask Mr. Zhang about Japan, and uh, but I want to press you on also about the debt, local government debt issues, and from where you sit in the central government, and do you think the, uh, because the figure which I um, located is actually in 1997, almost there's no local government debt at all. And uh, now I think the local government debt is also already amount to be one third of the national GDP. I think the whole Chinese economy. And uh, so from your view, and do you think is that a, uh, is that a problem? Uh, what's the solution? Uh, I think it's a problem, but I agree with Professor Lee that it's not a serious problem. If you look at the overall debt ratio for the GDP, the central government debt ratio for GDP is about 20%. Then the local government debt for GDP's ratio is about 40%. So put this together, it's 60% of the GDP. That's the public debt. Compared with the international situation, everyone knows the US government debt is 100% of its GDP. For the European Union zone, the public debt ratio for GDP is net percent. For Japan, the sovereign debt is 230 percent of their GDP. So that's one thing I think. Compared with those countries, the ratio is not so high. And most important thing is that we are pay a great attention to solve this problem. There have several ways. For example, we have decided to implement a relatively comprehensive regulation system for the local government debt. We have emphasized to push ahead the mixed ownership economy. That means some of the local state-owned enterprises can transfer their assets to the private sector, which means in some extent the local government can get some revenue to reduce their burden for the local debt. And of course, the most important for the local debt problem is the efficiency of quality of the development, which everyone mentioned that even though the interest rate had been slowing down, but the quality <coughs> had been increased step by step. And also, the Radiant. China's economic development, because the base is in a relatively high level, China is number one in the world, in the last year, the real GDP increase rate of China is 7.7%. But if you calculate the appreciation of the local currency to the United States dollar, if you take account the CPI, so the nominal GDP of the China in last year, personally I have calculated, is about 9.2 trillion US dollars. So with the 
high quality development with the much bigger of the cake, the revenue of the local government, the price of the property, which part of those owned by the local government can have means they have more capability to solve this kind of the debt problem. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zhang. And uh, I think, um, uh, because one of the other issues, let's move on to uh, uh, the other issue, which is about China's outbound investment. I think this is also one of the issues which uh, I think uh, will be interesting in uh, many of uh, our guests and delegates in the, uh, and in the audience. And in, I think in 2012, I think China's uh, outbound direct investment has reached a record high. And the figure which I uh, was given is uh, close to 90 billion US dollars. 90 billion US dollars. And obviously, I think um, the rest of the world need the, the capital from China. And, but China also needs to basically articulate and find its own strategy. I think, um, and uh, I, I want to turn to Neil. And uh, Neil has been, as I mentioned, that one of the leading a venture capitalist and who has a very savvy eye for good investment. And um, at the moment, I think most of the Chinese investors, be it uh, from state owned enterprises or private owned, they're mainly dominating in the area of uh, resources and energies. So I just wonder whether you can share some of the trends which you have discovered in recent years. Yeah, I think you know, 10 years ago, that's probably true, but it's no longer the case. Um, I think First of all, there are two, uh, you know, sort of uh, capital flows. One is as a financial investor. I think China clearly has accumulated a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, asset, and they want to diversify. It makes perfect sense as a financial investor allocating, uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of um, assets around the globe. Uh, so this is more like a financial investment into, you know, global bond and equity, etc. The second one is more sort of strategic investment. Yes, 10, 15 years ago, that's mostly driven by Steel enterprises making uh, acquisitions or investment in area like mining or so natural resources. But the last five, ten years, in fact, the bigger headline ones are, you know, either uh, sort of mixed shareholding companies or private companies uh, starting to make inroads into international uh, um, arena. If you look at the last five years, uh, six years, the three prominent acquisitions for Chinese company in the Western world is, uh, you know, Shanghui's acquisition of Smithfield, yeah, sure. uh, you know, Lenovo's acquisition of IBM Notebook, and, uh, you know, the last year's um, vendor acquisition of AMC Cinemas. These three are all more or less private companies and taking on consumer companies or manufacturing companies, or technology companies uh, elsewhere. So I think this is what's going to happen probably more in the next five, ten years. I mean, the Chinese company, which uh, grows strong enough, they have the ability uh, to uh, make acquisitions and integrate their business uh, with different angles. For example, you know, uh, in the case of Lenovo, they make sure that they are, you know, no, they're not just a top three, top four player in the notebook market, but they're not a number one. And then, uh, you know, companies like Shanghui will leverage that and make sure that, you know, they will en enhance or upgrade they are, you know, food, con you know, uh, you know, manufacturing qualities in China. So, you know, everyone uh, like those has a strategic angle to that. They're not just financial investor. And I see this, you know, um, will will actually happen more. Um, as I said, I mean, the Chinese company now is, you know, grow bigger, and more importantly, they do have the management bandwidth to deal with that. And that's the more, you know, uh, um, important aspect. Of it. But I think, for example, I think many of the Chinese businesses, I think, they really want to enter into the American market. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder with the professor from where you sit in New York, that uh, do you think that um, Chinese business and Chinese capital is still encountering some of the big barriers, you know, for them to get into some of the sectors which they're very interested? Um, yeah, there are certainly barriers, especially in the United States, because uh, U.S. like other countries considered uh, as two issues. One is uh, national security considerations. So there are some sectors that are considered to be sensitive where investment by Chinese firms are going to be restricted. Uh, secondly, uh, the U.S. and other countries have taken the attitude that, you know, uh, sovereign wealth funds are essentially state-owned. One thing is to do passive investments that are okay, but if you're making strategic investments, it goes against the grain of having liberalization and privatization of the economy, where you are going to have 
state-owned enterprises are going to be having a controlling interest uh, in large corporations around the world. So I think that that's some of the backlash you've seen uh, uh, in the United States. You see also similar kind of backlash, mm -hmm. for example, also in Canada. There's an element of resource nationalism. Some countries prefer to have national control of their own uh, reserves. So I think that uh, the broader trend is going to be also one in which China so far has been accumulating net foreign assets in the form of foreign reserves. Those foreign reserves are now over three trillion. It's becoming excessive. Uh, the PBOC doesn't want to keep on uh, intervening, accumulating reserves as a way of uh, preventing excessive appreciation of the currency. So one of the strategies of China might be to liberalize capital controls, especially on outflows to allow then SOEs or private firms to accumulate foreign assets as opposed to the PBOC. That would have the effect of diversifying your foreign assets towards uh, the private sector, the SOEs, preventing currency appreciation is excessive and then telling America, you see, we're not intervening in the Forex market, therefore there is not a problem with us as well. And I think the broader longer term trend is going to be also one of trying to internationalize the role of the RMB as a reserve currency. Uh, I think that over the long term that can occur, but traditionally reserve currencies have the following features. You have flexible exchange rates, yep. and in China it's still managed. Two, you have to liberalize capital controls on inflows and outflows. That's something that China is going to do only slowly. Otherwise, you're not going to be a store of value if there are restrictions of that sort. Three, you have to create a deep and liquid market for local currency debt that is tradable, that can be a reserve currency. And you've also to liberalize your financial markets. All those things are happening in China, but they're happening relatively slowly. So I don't yet see China becoming a major reserve currency. But of course, over the long term, with the rise of economic, financial, and trading power of China, even the role of the RMB as an important reserve currency, not as a substitute to the US dollar, but then one of the additional ones may become another important trend in international finance. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Before we actually open the, uh, 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 the question to the floor, I think I just want to uh, uh, give the chance uh, for um, Professor Dockley to, uh, um, to, re um, to respond. Uh, talking about uh, the financial and the Chinese financial reform, in, especially in terms of, uh, I think, the time, timeline or the timetable of making a RMD, the RMD as a convertible policy, because this is something which... Uh, while you were a member of the monetary committee, sometimes you were feel constrained in talking about it. Mm -hmm. Do you really think the Chinese leaders, especially the central bankers, have a firm plan about when China will actually make its currency convertible? Well, let me first talk about the outward investment, then come back to your question, okay. because these two are really interrelated. Uh, let me put on the table square, squarely. China is the largest outward investor in the world, period. Right? At least 250 billion a year. Because that's basically the current account balance, current account surplus, I should say, right? Unfortunately, so far, these kind of investments are, are mostly done through the central bank. So the trend, if I may trend, the trend is very clear. The trend is to gradually lift the capital account to allow people like you and me to acquire US dollar and go abroad and buy foreign financial products. What kind of financial products Chinese people should buy from an economic perspective? Very simple. Buy things, buy shares of enterprises who are getting profits from China. Yeah. Apple, Apple computer. Apple computer produces most amount of computers in China, and yet at the same time, China is the third largest market of Apple. Mm -hmm. You can tell me how much profit of Apple comes from China. Mm -hmm. However, today, all the Chinese, most of the Chinese households have nothing to do with the increase of the, sh of the share of the Apple, Apple company. Same thing can be said about my good friend, my good company, Volkswagen, right? Your share must be, have been increasing over the years. Your profit from China is huge, right? Anyway, so this is a, the trend. Now, um, capital, now, the internationalization and financial reform, I don't think it is the objective of the Chinese senior policy makers, including central bank governor and, the, and the, the, the premier, to push the internationalization of RMB. I don't think that's a strategy. Because part of, one reason is because they know very clearly that we are far, far away from undermining 
uh, the U.S. the role of the U.S. dollar. Plus, China is a, you know one of the largest beneficiaries of today's international monetary system, right? Three point five trillion reasons for that, right? So much money is invested in U.S. dollar. We don't want to 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 undermine the system too quickly. Now, so what is their goal? The goal is to open up the capital account, is to make the economy more balanced. So talking about financial reforms, uh, I think this year, 2014, we definitely will see some actions. First, in interest rate liberalization, for sure. I think 75% of the job is done. The lending side is already fully free. The borrowing side, deposit side is almost free. Now there's nobody, very few people, go to the bank and put the bank into the fixed income, the fixed interest rate products. We all go to the internet and look for the highest interest rates of, among banks, right? Second thing this year, for sure, I think we will see some actions in, op in gradually opening up capital account. Maybe, maybe with starting with high net worth accounts. People have five million, U five million yuan in, in bank account. Then allow them to convert 10%, because these guys are able to take more risk than other people. And also, most important, this year, I think we will definitely see some private banks in certain regions be allowed to enter into the banking sector. Okay, just let me stop you there. I'm anxious to give her 10 minutes, sir, to our uh, friends here. Sir. Uh, I'm John Negroponte. I was wondering if... Uh, one or more of the panelists could address the issue of China's energy picture because uh, last night I attended a session on the <coughs> geopolitical consequences of the shale revolution in the United States and so on and so forth. And I think one unknown factor is what the prospects for energy production are in China going forward. And I'd be interested in hearing your views on that. I think I'll probably, I think, I uh, mean, Mr. wants to. <laughs> You know, China now is the largest energy consumption country, even larger than the United States. But the big challenge for us is that in our energy consumption mix, coal is shared about 65%. It's just the another end, because in the world energy consumption mix, the coal is only about 33%. So this occurred a serious problems of the air pollution, particularly in last year. <coughs> it has attracted more folks, not only for the Chinese people, Chinese government, but even all over the world. So the strategy for Chinese government is to try to optimize our energy mix. That means we will accelerate to develop the renewable and clean energy, which means we will accelerate to develop the wind power, solar power. We try to develop the natural gas domestically, and also we have import relatively huge amount of the natural gas. In the year 2012, the natural gas imported to China increased 34% compared to the year 2011. And in last year, the natural gas increased another 20%. So nowadays, the natural gas consumption within China, the imported proportion is already reached 35%. But still, you know, just in last month for the GCCT, the Chinese side asked the U.S. government allowed to export LNG to China. And of course, there's still another way try to develop the you know, hydropower. Still, they have some potential, the bioenergy, and of course, clean coal technology is a big challenge because still coal is a major energy resource for China. Thank you. Please, sir. Hello, I'm a French journalist, Philippe Mabi from La Tribune. I have a question about uh, innovation in China uh, as a, in a French point of view, because China, Dongfeng, take a, a 
part of participation in uh, Peugeot, maybe uh, the automobile uh, uh, constructor in uh, in France, and uh, uh, also uh, Chinese group uh, with EDF in nuclear plants. They, you have uh, uh, participation in uh, nuclear in uh, UK. So, how much uh, do you think that uh, China's group are going to? Upgrade in uh, added value in uh, new uh, businesses like we, we are doing, and how uh, are you going to be our competitors in our businesses uh, uh, in, in the future? Okay, we want to. Uh, Neil, do you want to talk something about the innovation? Um, Thank you. I, I guess your question is more uh, how, you know, what sort of Chinese angle to. Um, uh, as a strategic shareholder for a uh, foreign com you know, company. Is that the correct? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, in fact, I want just to, to expand a little bit uh, on what I have been said before. I mean, the, you, know, the, the, you know, the very reason why those acquisitions happen is that because the Chinese companies see themselves as an angle. And I think, you know, for acquisition is, is obviously uh, one of the, you know, uh, route people talk. But probably more and more nowadays, um, you know, strategic minority shareholding probably makes sense. Because managing an integrated uh, local operation will prove to be more challenge. But China uh, oftentimes has an angle. And that angle will oftentimes come from two, you know, two sides. One is that we have a very big market. So you can test you know, sort of, you know, that, that, you know, your product and services in that whole market. Then secondly, I think in many areas, we actually are quite uh, advanced uh, or you know, competitive on a global basis. For example, uh, in the information technology world. Um, in fact, if today, uh, if there's any sort of, uh, you know, uh, leading e-commerce company could have a bigger uh, international market share, that would be probably more likely to be Alibaba than Amazon or, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, eBay. So these company has already in the last several years tested the Chinese market for many years. So they accumulate a lot of experience. That's the critical part. For example, I'll give you one example. Uh, you know, in you know today's world, there are two very important applications. One is WeChat, I, I guess some of you use, and the other is WhatsApp, which is obviously very popular among uh, you know developed uh, developed countries. Now, WeChat, because their nature of uh, you know uh, uh, you know coming out of uh, Tencent, uh, they they know how to monetize it without affecting user experience, because Tencent had done many many mobile game uh, you know and embedded into QQ. So this is very easy for them. Now that experience could be very relevant and could be very helpful for companies like WhatsApp or many other U.S. companies to monetize it. And because this is something China is a couple of years ahead of, uh, you know, other people. So I see that kind of experience, some know-how skill sets, China could actually transfer or pass on when they get into a new, you know, uh, you know, a, a new region and makes, you know, um, a, you know, investment into companies. Okay, one more question. Maybe there. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, um, my name is Alana Petrov. I'm with CNN Money. Um, Professor Rubini, I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more I, about um, you learning Mandarin and the process that you've gone through for that and when you started. Just a few more details on that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I used to have a, actually a Taiwanese uh, girlfriend, so <laughs> that, my first experience of learning some Chinese was that. <laughs> and there are 1.3 billion Chinese in the world, and I would say that any person that is thinking about uh, living in this world uh, should think about the world where China is going to become the first largest economy in the world. And that's why in the Upper East Side of New York, uh, every wealthy individual is having a nanny who's Chinese for their children. I don't have any children yet, so. <laughs> uh, but if I ever have one, certainly I would like to have them learn Mandarin from the age of one as a, as a first, second language. So we live in a world in which the role of China is going to be increasingly important. Of course, uh, English is the lingua franca of, uh, of international business. And even in this panel, all these Chinese are speaking fluent English. But I'd say that as a way of understanding China, and we don't understand as Western as China well, understanding the language to learn about the culture, the literature, the political discourse, the diplomatic, and so on. And Mandarin is going to become a key language. So that's the future where we're going to. 
Thank you very much. I think certainly this is a session, I think, with a very human face. I think I would like to still maybe one minute, I think, of your web time. And the final question, which I want to give each of the panelists, the 10 seconds. And in the next 12 months, you know, any risk factor that you think will actually derail what the Chinese government want to achieve economically? And um, I will take from uh, Dr. Um, Professor Li Dokui. Uh, too quick uh, deflation of the property price. Too quick decline of property price, which is very unlikely. You would However, nail down of the property I still market. Keep this in mind. Okay, thank you. Professor Rubin. Uh, we have not spoken about the geopolitical issues, but certainly these territorial tensions between uh, China and Japan and some of the other neighbors already having an impact on trade and foreign direct investment. I would say that both sides should be taking a diplomatic stance about resolving this problem, but there is a lingering concern that even just by accident, things could escalate, and that will be something disastrous. So I hope that both sides, the leaders, are going to realize that diplomacy is the way to go. That's a risk that the one will have to consider, however low. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Of course, accelerate the reform and the opening and accelerate to transfer the development pattern and optimize our industry structure. Thank you. Uh, you know, a country like a company, so you have a, a annual budget, an annual plan, and the risk is the execution risk. I think we do have a very clear plan, and the risk is how to execute it, especially with the challenging, you know, full economic reform, you know, um, in place. Victor, your last word. Apart from the accident with uh, Japan, I think we didn't talk about public health. I think if there were a, a another major avian flu or similar um, event, it was distracted uh, reform program uh, in the short term. So I think that's actually completed the session on Chan Look, I think even with uh, Professor Rubini's presence, I think we managed to actually achieve something quite upbeat. So I think China, despite the problem it's facing, is still is an area that is a one of, enjoy one of the highest growth. It's one of the areas which enjoy, I think, you know, innovative drive. This is one of the country which is still things are happening. So I think I just want to say that and to end today's session. And let's give a round of applause to our five panelists. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.